Uh, my name is Becky Larson. Uh, I am from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I am in the Biological Systems Engineering Department. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, some work we did looking at inact inactivation of dairy manure-borne pathogens uh, through anaerobic digestion. I want to know there's a lot of people that were part of this study. Um, wasn't the only one getting covered in manure. There were other people out there doing the same thing. Um, uh, particularly with the path pathogen side, um, I could say a lot of the things I am going to talk about today. A year or two ago, I would have had to Google them all. So um, I just want you to be aware. Mark couldn't make it today because he's enjoying himself in spring break. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the pathogen stuff. So make sure not to ask me any questions I haven't already asked him. Okay. Uh, so a little bit about digesters. Uh, we only have 20 minutes, so I'm going to quickly go through um, a lot of slides. So uh, if you have any questions at the end, you can always find me later if needed. Um, so digesters, uh, microbial degradation of organic material to produce biogas, um, then which contains methane. We can use that for various different things, electrical production, compressed gas, et cetera. Um, a lot of these on-farm systems, the main constituent uh, for their feedstocks is manure, um, and manure contains pathogens. So one of the maybe side benefits of these systems is that they can inactivate or destroy pathogens um, that potentially pose a little risk to humans and animals. Uh, but, but the big point there is they're not designed for this, right? So they operate at high temperatures. Um, you know, there's kind of different ranges, mesophilic, thermophilic, so that really has an impact on, and design of the digester ha really has an impact on what we might see for pathogen kill. Um, so there's a lot of pathogens. Uh, we did this with dairy manure, um, bacteria, protozoa, viruses, lots of different types of each. Um, they are, you know, if Mark was giving this, he would scare you a little bit. Uh, when I have to admit, when I first started this, I kind of... You know, I thought, well, pathogens are a concern when they get in my water and other things, but I work around, you know, dairy manure all the time. I don't find myself getting sick and things, but I have a very different thinking um, than that now. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of different things within manure that can pose human health issues as well as uh, animal health issues. Uh, and, a, and a lot of the questions that I would ask Mark, he would kind of react with, you know, you're around manure a lot. There's a lot of reasons why you yourself might not be susceptible, although he claims after talking to me a few times that I got sick after doing some of our work. Um, but, but there are some pretty serious concerns uh, related to pathogens in manure. Um, it, they may not, you know, the, they, the potential is there, uh, whether or not how high the risk is, uh, some of those things we still have to determine. Okay, so uh, some of the things that we looked up are like cryptosporidium parvum. Um, you know, large waterborne disease outbreak in U.S. history. A lot of immunocompromised, uh, immunocompromised people can um, result in death. A lot of hospitalized patients. Uh, e. coli, um, not a big thing uh, for, for other dairy uh, cattle, but can cause severe diarrhea. Uh, a lot of death, quite a few deaths per year. And this was the big issue uh, in, a, in an outbreak in Walkertown, Ontario, which caused Canada to kind of revamp a lot of their um, water quality restrictions in, in their drinking water. Uh, salmonella, so I think a lot of us have heard of a lot of these. Um, I'm going to fly through these really quick. I, I left these slides in here, so later if you want to download it and look at some of the things, you're, you're welcome to. Um, and then there's things that also um, can have some potential with uh, pathogens within one facility. So, you know, one of the big things we talked about when we worked with the producers is they were more interested um, in things that may be able to cause um, effects not only in human health but uh, to other things within their um, actual herds. All right. So I'm going to get to a little bit of information here. This is some background things that Mark had worked on before um, just to kind of get in to show you an idea of what is in manure and how much it changes. So this is some studies he had done previously looking at um, within manure storage lagoons, what's kind of present within there. So you can see uh, the, the variety of different viruses, bacteria, et cetera, that you see at any one time. Uh, for this second particular um, one, you can see in the same thing just a year later or half of a year later or in different times, very different structure of what is within the manure. 
So very, a lot of changes to the actual pathogen content. Uh, and, you know, storage is one good way to reduce pathogen content, um, but it can change pretty drastically before it even gets to storage. So you can see here, um, he was measuring some applied as it was pumped out of the storage. You can see, you know, around November, it was really low concentrations. Up in April, it was very high, just as animals may, you know, get sick or other things, it varies pretty drastically from time to time. And that's what we saw as we continued this study. Uh, so what we knew beforehand, um, there's lots of studies out there that show a lot of indicators um, that can reduce 99% of pathogens um, through digestion. Uh, we know thermophilic is more effective as it has a higher temperature. Um, and, and pathogen kill or removal really depends upon temperature, pH, and what your retention time uh, is through that system. Uh, we hadn't really seen a whole lot of data on inactivation on a full-scale operational systems um, and, and what that might look like for not just indicator species, but some other things that are, might be more important. Okay. Um, so in this study, the objective was to look at inactivation at farm scale, um, evaluate certain factors, uh, what happened at different farms, what time of year was it, um, what, had, what, what kind of kind of following the fate of these pathogens, not only through the digestion process, but also, also the separation process afterwards. Okay, so the study overview, we had nine farms. We sampled them for about 10 months. Um, we did a lot of nutrient and other thing removal, but today I'm just gonna focus on the pathogen work. Uh, we had kind of three basic different systems. Um, one was a plug flow digest digesters that you see at the top. Uh, all of those had a screw press for a separation system. So we measured and we sampled after each, before and after each process flow. So we measured before the digester, after the digester, and then the liquid in the solid following the separation process. Um, we also had two completely mixed digesters, uh, which one had a screw press and one had a centrifuge. Um, and then we had uh, two systems, which we'll call a bedding recovery unit. Um, I'll show you a picture in one second of what that looks like. Um, and then we measured lots and lots of things um, on all of those. Okay, so here's an example. Up in the left corner is a completely mixed system. That's the big circular tank, a uh, plug flow. Uh, you'll see a lot of these. Um, the office or the company that produces most of these is out of Wisconsin, so it's kind of it's been a big implementation within the U.S. as a large amount of plug flows. Um, as compared to some other countries, um, but that's kind of like an in-ground, rectangular, uh, defined flow path. Uh, here's an example of a screw press separator, uh, just kind of, um, there's a screen, it's, there's a screw, it pushes the solids out and the liquids kind of go down a tube. Uh, the centrifuge, just as it sounds, it rotates uh, and you get some separation that way. This is a bedding recovery unit. Uh, some people are less familiar with this, but it has a screw press first and then it goes through like a drying drum. Uh, with a designed retention time through that system. Uh, here's all the pathogens and indicators that were analyzed. Uh, one of the concerns um, that Mark had initially, why he included some indicators, um, like bovine bacteriorities down here, is because with that variation that we see in the herd uh, of the pathogens that are within it, if we didn't have it initially, uh, then how could we measure what happened to it afterwards? So we, we were kind of stuck with the confines of what their um, pathogen content look like ahead of time. So uh, highlighted here are what was actually detected during the study. Um, so there, there were some issues here and there. I think Mark work, and his team worked most of, them, most of them out. It was, I think, new to, for them to work a little bit with manure, uh, but they put a lot of work into kind of developing their methods um, to detect certain things here. Okay, so as we go through this, um, I just want you to remember as we, these are, are in log removals, all of the graphs that we have. So a one log removal is about a 90% reduction, a two log removal, 99, three log, 99.9, .9, et cetera. Um, so what we did here is we did it at a retention time of approximately 21 days. So I know that it, you might think of, so we sampled on kind of a regular basis and then we had to skew it. Although the digesters didn't all have a retention of 21 days, we had to choose a duration that was kind of in between a regular sampling because they all have different ones and just due to sampling issues, I can explain that to you if you want to ask me later. Okay, so here's uh, 
digester removal by pathogen type, you can see uh, the variation that we see uh, from zero log all the way up to almost 10 log removal um, of, of various different things. So one thing that uh, Mark wanted, that always tells me about this particular slide is that we expected to see a lot of these things. So the ones that are easily destroyed, um, typically by heat, we see a lot of destruction of those particular uh, pathogen types. Um, here's kind of a, a log removal of bacteriorities. Um, you can see digester three and digester eight um, are the completely mixed systems. I know a lot of people seem to think because they don't have a defined flow path and that there isn't, you know, when you look at the digestion system that we might not get as much removal. But we can see here for this particular, uh, for this indicator, that, that that might not be true. All right, so here's some of the more interesting things that I think that I saw that Mark kind of showed me. Um, so when, when we look at this, you can see the very back columns. So these are for each of the farms. The very back columns um, are before it went into the digester. Now the column in front of that, you can see probably a log or so removal right there um, is after the digestion. And then the next bar in front of that is the liquid. And then the final bar is the solids that are in the front there. So you can see what we saw is that you do get some reduction uh, through the digester, pretty significant. Um, I know it's it, sometimes it's hard to tell because of the way the scale is, but that's a pretty decent reduction that you see there. Um, but the big thing was we really saw the majority of the pathogens remaining in the liquid content after a separator as compared to the solid content. Um, here is the polyomavirus. Um, you can see the log removals there, kind of varied through there. But again, we saw that same general trend, right? So I, I only put up these kind of two. I don't have time to go through all the things we measured. But this was a very similar trend that we saw from uh, site to site, uh, back pathogen to pathogen. Um, you can see I wanted to show you one removal over time so you can see how variable the removal is, right? So just as I said, these systems aren't particularly designed to do pathogen inactivation. So they are not in any way, shape, or form kind of holding to uh, any kind of constraints there. The operation changes, the influent changes, the removal is different from system to system. Um, this is where you can see kind of detec detection. So there is a limit to the detection level of these pathogens. Um, in this slide, we just kind of wanted to show a lot of detections in um, the, the pre, and then a lot of in a lot of cases, we didn't get a lot of detects later in the system. So I would, you know, it, it is a good example of that you really do see some destruction of a lot of these pathogens. Um, again, here's rotavirus A. The last one was Campylobacter. Uh, much less detection on this rotavirus A, um, but we still see very few detections in the solid portion. Uh, again, this is just kind of, you can see the very small, like the, the solid is in red, you barely see that, and that's the, the uh, what percent kind of ended up in each fraction. You can see it was very significant uh, in the liquid portion, as with many of the other pathogens that we measured. All right, so these last two slides that I have um, of data are looking at the, the separators that did not have a digester. So... Um, they did have a controlled heat. So the first separated solid is just coming out of um, the, the, the screw press. So for the bettering re recovery unit, um, we have the manure, then we have the liquid that comes off of that screw press, the solid here, and then it goes through a heating process. Um, I think Mark was pretty amazed that not only in this heating process, but some of the others that use exhaust heat to dry the solids, didn't result in complete inactivation or elimination of pathogens. And again, that's because these systems don't really have the controls all the time to do that, right? We have shutdowns, we have times where we're not maintaining the temperature, uh, retention times change, et cetera. A lot of these systems probably could be designed, these kind of follow-up steps to, to really reduce those, but at this point, they don't have those um, there. You can see the second site was pretty similar. Okay. Uh, a few things that I want to mention about the, the limitations of the study is that the sampling frequency wasn't based on digester retention again. Um, therefore, uh, the manure and the digestate samples aren't truly coupled. I think if anyone else has done manure work, it's very difficult to couple the samples anyway. There's a lot of variability, even if I had the exact retention time of the digester. It's, it, it's pretty difficult 
to to get a digester retention rate to be that accurate regardless. But but they were pretty close. We did the best that we could. Um, again, this is measure of inactivation of pathogens and in indicator genomes. We used a qPCR method. Um, we didn't do culturing, so it's not a measure of infectivity or viability um, that that has to be done with another uh, measurement method. Um, and again, a lot of concentrations in many samples were near the assay limit of detection, um, so it, it really reduces the accuracy of the log removal estimate. So if we couldn't detect it, right, it, it made it a little bit more difficult to get that. Um, but, but the main conclusions that we see is we really do see a reduction of over 90 percent to 99.9 .9 percent of many of the pathogens there. Um, it, it varied by type, by farm, by time. We're really trying to work the statistics out to get some some, you know, to put some statistical validation to the study, it's just difficult with the design of on-farm work. Um, but, but we're working on it and we'll get it together before we publish this information. Um, the liquid fraction, again, contained the majority of the pathogens. You know, we're kind of trying to figure out why that is, whether it's due to uh, the nature of the size of the screens and the size of the, you know, what was actually able to pass through the screens. and the fact that maybe they they have issues with wanting to be in water or not be in water, still kind of talking through some of those issues. Um, although the solids fraction and liquid, you know, although all of it contained less pathogens after the digester, um, there is still potential that the concentrations are high enough to cause risk. Okay, so. Um, things that you want to keep in mind. Uh, again, it, there still can be risks because of that. These systems are designed to produce biogas, not to inactivate pathogens. They are helpful. They do result in a reduction, which can then potentially reduce uh, possible effects, but that is a whole other thing that needs to be assessed separately that can't be taken from the results that we have here. All right, I just wanted to mention one other thing we're doing with pathogens is our manure irrigation work. Uh, so we're looking at pathogen transport now after the digester uh, through through some um, traveling gun systems and through center pivots, and we're looking at uh, inactivation and trying to model some of the things that we've seen. We have some really interesting results for that. Uh, hopefully in the future I'll be able to share some of those with you. So we, we did our measurements directly out of the digester and directly out of the, the uh, separation system because we didn't want that effect to be to have some kind of impact. But Mark's previous work has looked at a bit of that and measured those, those first kind of slides. He's looked at that before and seen inactivation rates. I don't know off the top of my head what that. Yes, I agree. So, and that's kind of my point. It's these systems you shouldn't implement for this reason alone. You know, obviously there's probably other ways, cheaper ways to get at that inactivation, but it might be a way, a, a kind of a byproduct benefit of these types of systems. Yeah, those were still, so th that's what I was trying to say, and I know I was going quick there, with the, with the way that scale works. So even, you know, going from a million to 100,000, that's a pretty significant reduction. So you really see that, that and that scale, that's what makes it tough, is that, in a bar, it looks like a little bit, but that's actually a pretty significant change from the top one to the to the next one. So you see that reduction in the liquid even, um, but the, even in that post one, the very much smaller step, that's still a lot of times a lo one log reduction. Um, but whether those concentrations are low enough to really not pose some issue later is questionable. Yeah, so we, we looked at you know, as best we could. Uh, we, we tried to track a lot of things at a, more of the farms, and temperature was maybe the one that we got pretty consistent. Um, and so it, it didn't, the, the consistency of temperature is, is pretty good. They fluctuate very little. So in, in their readings, you know, maybe 5%, uh, 5 degrees Fahrenheit changes throughout the system. It, it really wasn't that significant. Um, in terms of that, the, the post processing after the, the separation systems where we had heat for drying purposes, that's what fluctuated quite a bit and was hard to track and measure and those things were just 
a lot of the systems we were working with were relatively new on that end, so their, their operation of them wasn't so consistent. Yeah, uh, interestingly enough, even, it, it's more of a separation issue. So it, it has nothing to do with the digester and even any of the separation, centrifuge to screw press, to adding other things, you, you see that same uh, change. And so it, part of us is more interested in looking at more conventional, cheaper ways of separating liquid and solid. Does it end up with the same thing? I don't, I, I don't know that yet, but interesting thing. 